Eggs and sausages, a side of toast, burgers and fries, what kind of pie? <laughs> oh, I never get tired of a uh, boy Tom Waits right there. Well, it looks like it's just me this morning. Spathy Wa and Logic and all our homies are um, MIA, so we're just going to have to do it. Uh, so well. Yeah, we'll go kind of late. I made it, uh, made it in time for the garbage man, but not in time for the recycling man. Ain't that the way? <coughs> so we got uh, chapter three here. Mm, what did we get into yesterday? Was the um, introduction of uh, fucking? Let me get my hair out of my ass. Driving me crazy. Though I shouldn't complain, it's good to have any kind of hair at all. Ah, me... uh, ah! Uh. I'm gonna be editing in a fucking ponytail. This keeps up here. Yeah, hair keeps on growing. Uh, all my friends are like, "Yeah, I'm having to like tie it behind my eyes and so forth." We're gonna come out of this uh, looking like a bunch of fucking ponytail hippie ass hipsters and so forth. So, good morning, to everybody. Uh, yesterday we did an AMA on uh, with some crazy religious author uh, late into the night. Drank like half a bottle of whiskey just trying to get through this horse shit. And now today I'm like a little foggy. But uh, a good day nonetheless. Uh, what do we got going on here? I got my bicycle fixed yesterday. That's fucking fantastic. Uh, shout outs to um, Fulton Bikes for staying open during this whole nonsense. Those guys are super chill. I've always liked those dudes. Uh, I like the ones, uh, they used to have a location that was closer to me in bed -Stuy, And I got another one that's over there in uh, Clinton Hill, I guess. But uh, yeah, if you're in, if you need a bicycle, uh, those guys have always done me right. And their prices are super fucking reasonable. They're not paying me to say this. I just like them. Ugh, fucking New York City right here. I just got a, uh, a recon mission put down to me. All right, so we got some people here. Might as well start with the editing here. So, in eight days, uh, we've gotten through 50 pages, 
there. Uh, so if we do some math, <laughs> it doesn't look uh, promising there. Uh, because it looks like at this rate, uh, it will take us 80 days. Uh, so it might take three or four months to get through this um, this edit. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Like maybe if I get my act together and we start doing about three or four hours a day uh, consistently, we can cut that down to like two or three months. Uh, I'll tell you one thing is that I am in anticipating the return of the edit of Space Tards. So we're going to take a pause uh, from doing Lemon Maybe for a hot second and we'll go back to doing uh, space tards and this will be super fun because uh, that edit will be me uh, doing a side by side like a, a compare changes with an actual editor um, it's like a professional editor that we paid to uh, take a crack at fixing this so we can see um, and he'll leave comments and so forth uh, and, and things that he wants changed and so forth uh, so that'll be kind of neat to see the kind of things that I miss because uh, let's face it I'm not a pro oh my god going crazy out here I'm allergic to everything but yeah I, I think that'll be kind of cool uh, I like I like the process of like working through somebody's comments trying to see their thought process uh, you learn a fair bit uh, from editors and uh, I'm a, I've always been a believer in him so hopefully this guy doesn't fuck this up other than that uh, I'm happy to have a bicycle again and it's uh, nice out so I'm gonna go for a long ride today I'm looking forward to it and uh, that's all there is with me. So this is uh, chapter three, the wicked city of Desulfurim. Uh And so, if you don't know, we'll get into it a little bit. But Desulfurim is a um, uh, a drug that are given to uh, really unrepentant alcoholics who just uh, backslide over and over and over again. The drug makes it impossible for you to digest alcohol. Like if you uh, are on this drug, which you take uh, every day, it's a pill form. Um, if you're on this drug, like basically if you drink, if you eat like, you know, like some alcohol soaked cherry or, you know, like rum raisin ice cream, and even like the slightest taste of alcohol in something, you will start vomiting and you won't stop. Uh, it's <laughs> a very potent, um, uh, fucking anti-alcoholic thing. Uh, and it does work. Um, but, uh, uh so, uh, we'll get into that in a second. Give me one second here. Oh, good God. All right, there we go. <sighs> so, uh, chapter three. This takes place at 3.33 p.m. at City Hall Station. Uh, almost all of this book takes place in Manhattan. Uh, there are a few sections uh, that take place in Brooklyn and one uh, that takes place in Queens. But we don't get on fucking Staten Island or Jersey for any kind of... Oh, no, this, some shit goes down in Jersey, I guess. But it's, it's, not, it's not a major setting. Burgers and fries. Have you seen a child with red hair and a kippa? Yeah, about a million of them. Welcome to New York. Where were you on the night of September 13th? Balls deep in your mother. You got a warrant? I'm looking for a kid. Yeah, I bet you are, you fucking fruitcake. Fuck out of here. <laughs> uh, the chance has never uh, struggled so hard to find someone. Canvassing should, occur, canvassing should occur within 48 hours of a crime, not weeks later when the trail is dead as dog shit. He ought to be in uniform, but they took his shield. The best he can manage is his gray trench coat, worn shiny and thin at the elbows, matching a hat that's gone limp from the constant drizzle. Even in the dilapidated Sam Spade getup, everyone can tell he's police. After 17 years on patrol, every word he says and every motion he makes, scream, cop. So, every word he says and every motion he makes, scream, cop. Uh, every word he says and every motion he makes, screams, cop. It's weird, right? Because um, both of those sound wrong to me. Um, as we're talking about every word and every motion, I think it's because we have uh, split plurals there. So every word would be singular, even though we're talking about uh, whatever. And then every motion.
Yeah. It, I think it's right, but it, it feels it feels wrong to me. So, uh, trying to pass as a civilian is like walking on the moon. So, um, for anybody who's worked for a long time in like some kind of hierarchical institution, um, like the police or the military, or even in like, um, uh, I would assume like the legislature or whatever, anywhere where things are like very regimented and um, you do things in a weird way, like an unnatural way, like everything about being in the military is unnatural. You go against your basic nature. Uh, like, yeah, uh, you know, at the very core of the experience, like, like it's not natural to go towards like a bunch of explosions and, and shit like that. Uh, in fact, you should be going in the other way. And it's not natural to like wake up at 5 a.m., unless you're me, uh, <laughs> and uh, get yelled at by a bunch of shaved head retards and uh, stand in like a block 20 deep and 20 wide. That's all unnatural. And uh, think people become habituated to um, even like the most unnatural things to just after long enough of doing something, anything feels natural, which is a scary prospect. That's one of the um, the driving, interesting um, concepts in like the Shawshank Redemption. Uh, these prisoners who have been locked up for so long, they're afraid of being outside. And uh, um yeah, uh, Duchance has got a little of that going on. Uh, apparently, he's been a uh, cop for seventeen years. Seventeen years of patrolman. Jesus, that's that's like a tough fate. Still, Kaiser can't stop. He's got absolutely nothing else. He's too old and infamous to re-enlist, even if they would let him. The thought of trying to do EOD with his hands shaking this bad as a laugh. The thought of trying to do explosive ordnance disposal with his hands shaking this bad as a laugh. Every morning, the nurse watches him take an octagon of desulfurum. He has to open his mouth and show her he hasn't hidden it under his tongue. Then she watches him fill the cup, plainly unimpressed. Every day starts with that little humiliation and gets worse with every step he takes. No one wants to talk to him or be near him. They don't bother to hide him. No one wants to talk to him or be near him. They don't bother to hide it. They wrinkle their noses at the smell and sight of Duchance, eyes darting to the side for an exit. They pretend they don't speak English. They shake their heads and look at their shoes. They mutter something about not having any cash. When Kaiser grabs him by the shoulder, when Kaiser grabs him by the shoulder and forces the issue, their eyes fill with abrupt rage that swiftly melts into fear. Let's just do, yeah, that swiftly melts into fear. I feel like that could be a little bit better. But I'm drawing a blank on how. Uh, their eyes filled with startled. Yeah, you know, what's what's it like where somebody's like, like, they, that initial, like, uh, moment of anger, and then they realize that they should be afraid instead. Hmm. Well, that'll be past two, I guess. Something is very wrong with Kaiser Duchance, and everyone can tell. He's been stewing in this cauldron for weeks, 
and the gristle starting to break up. Every part of him hurts. The pain in his head fluctuates between insistent aches and blinding flashes that almost take him off his feet. The ulcer is seething in his stomach he used to drown in vodka is there all the time now. Jolted, uh, according to Mantis Cold. Hmm. Yeah, I see. I see kind of where you're getting at there with that like moment uh, where the the levers uh, sort of flicked and that whole fight or flight reflex. I can't. I, I still can't get over like the the part where it takes like thirty minutes to complete a fight or flight reflex, like where you're still feeling it half an hour later because the adrenaline system is it's like this old 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 piece of machinery in us uh, that uh, keeps going. The ulcer is seething in his stomach he used to drown in vodka is there all the time now. Without drink, there's no way to flush the tension out of him. It just accumulates like clay glomming onto an ar armature. Uh, so the Duchance chapter is just like nonstop similes and metaphors and so forth. This, uh, and this is slightly intentional. We're, we're trying to evoke some of that uh, like, uh, as it's a noir piece, right? U ultimately, if we want to characterize this, this is a uh, modern day noir fantasy uh, set in New York City. And we haven't got, we, the only element of it that's been fantasy so far has been like uh, Lemon meeting a kid who's invisible. Um, up to this point, like nothing else impossible has happened there. But many more impossible things will occur. This is, um, I'm not going to use the term urban fantasy because it's normally pretty gay. Uh, but, um, <laughs> But yeah, there's there's a lot of this, and there's potentially too much of it. Like both, he's been stewing in a cauldron, and the gristle's starting to break up, which I like as a metaphor. And then without drink, there's no way to flush the tension out of him. It just accumulates like clay glomming onto an armature. Every stranger Kaiser approaches is molding him. Wrenching and twisting, shaping into some ty terrible idol of rage. All right, and that's the point where I think we're laying it on a little fucking thick there. Rage. And so there the usage of idol is like a, a craven idol. Like idolatry. Every stranger tells Kaiser to fuck off is molding him, wrenching and twisting that wrench wrenching and twisting the anger, shaping him into an idol of rage. Alright, so in this paragraph, uh we attempt through the uh ham fisted uh science of metaphor to uh, say that Kaiser Duchance is real mad. <laughs> Kaiser had no idea how much armor he was wearing before. Not just the Kevlar, but the uniform, the gun, the posture, the static shield of his crackling radio. It was all insulating him from these people. Without the booze and the badge, Kaiser is naked. Now he can feel all their unfiltered contempt, the rawness of their hate. He deserves all of it. Do chances everything people despise about the police. A drunken, murdering fiend, scrambling like a rat to escape the consequences of his actions. If they hadn't taken his gun, and he'd have eaten it a dozen times by now. Probably be reincarnated as some sort of invertebrate. <laughs> Today is especially bad. Not one good lead all morning. Kaiser got caught in the rain, and now his shoes are squelching with every step. The weather's driven him underground. You can't question people when they're sprinting through the rain. Well, 
when they're sprinting through a downpour. Now he's haunting the subway system, eyes peeled for Jew hats and street kids. A whole day of dead ends leads Kaiser to the southbound platform at the City Hall station. Now he's questioning a candy kid named Jerome, who has two taped together cardboard boxes full of snacks tucked under his arm. Kaiser's just running through the script while the kid's smacking his gum. He doesn't expect to get anything. Uh, let's, let's make this a separate paragraph. Kaiser's just running through the script while the kid's smacking his gum. He doesn't expect to get anything, but Jerome's nodding. His eyes light up with recognition when Kaiser tells him about the shooting on the 13th. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Wild shit. Wild shit. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Wild shit, Jerome says, still chewing. Kaiser blinks. It's been so long since anyone has answered his questions, he's half forgotten why he's asking. There was a witness at the scene, a boy about your age. Jewish, thick glasses, curly red hair, wearing a kippah. That's one of those little hats. That remind you of anyone? That remind you of anyone? Oh yeah, most definitely. Let me think. What was his name? Jerome chews loudly, stroking the scraggly hairs on his chin as he ponders. Kaiser doesn't breathe. He's been waiting for this so long. He's been waiting for this moment for so long. Jerome catches his eye and grins for a second. Then he spits his gum at Duchance. The wad scores a direct hit right at the bridge of Kaiser's nose. Uh, right at the bridge of Kaiser's nose. Flecks of wintergreen spittle sting his eyes. Jerome doesn't even bother to run away. He just stares back at Duchance with a shit-eating grin. What are you going to do about it, old man? Kaiser glances up at the CCTV uh, camera peering down at him. Then he belts. <laughs> Kaiser glances up at the security camera pointing, peering down at them and shrugs he belts Jerome in the mouth so hard it almost knocks him onto the tracks <laughs> then he winds up like <laughs> All right, so let's make that. Fuck it. Yeah, it's just, you know, like it's one of those Snickers moments where you just uh, fucking belt uh, a 14-year-old kid so hard you almost knock him onto the subway tracks. Good God almighty. Yeah, that feel when. <laughs> now we're getting into the part of the book I like. This shit is all ultra violence all the way through. Never stops. Hell yeah. Uh, Kaiser glances up at the security camera, peering down at them. Fuck it. He winds up and belts Jerome in the mouth so hard it almost knocks him onto the tracks. Kaiser puts everything behind the punch, like he would hit a grown man, and it connects with the terrible crack of a home run. The kid's laid out with his head resting on the raised divots of the yellow warning strip at the edge of the platform. Now, you know what? That's not a terrible crack. That's a satisfying. Kaiser wrings his hand in the air. He'll be feeling that one for days. The kid's laid out with his head resting on the raised divots of the yellow warning strip. Yeah, this is this is a 
kind of word salad here. The kid's laid out. His head is resting on the raised divots of the uh, yellow strip at the platform edge. Uh, so Mantis Code says, am I reading the internal monologue of Kaiser? Uh, no, actually. Um, so this book is told in third person uh, quasi omniscient uh, through a narrator. So the whole book is narrated uh, by a character that we meet in the very first chapter, uh, Lemon Lemoyne. He owns a dive bar in Hell's Kitchen. So a lot of this is told as if it's his story. Um, and it's not its not um, set up in a structure like, hey, gather around, kids, let me tell you a tale. That's something that went down in old New York City. You know, not, It's not like that. Um, but there's a consistent narrator voice, or meant to be one, uh, and it is Lemon's voice. That's why you get like these hokey fucking metaphors and... Uh, um, all this yeah like so um the narrator here is uh it, this is a weird book in terms of the way that it's set up it's written in uh present tense uh third person omniscient which is weird right like um not a lot of that shit floating around uh so we're kind of a little in the experimental territory but i think that it uh, works out for this particular style of book because it really lends kind of that uh new york grimy what the fuck is going on? Um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, a lot of the real like uh, dark crime writers. Like I love um, I'm a, uh, James Elroy is like a huge favorite of mine. I loved uh, fucking L.A. Confidential and uh, <laughs> White Jazz and all kinds of uh, you know these incredibly brutal policemen and uh, really ham fisted narrative uh, driving home uh, his point. Oh, love it, but uh, it ain't for everybody. So let's, let's get down to here. Kaiser rings his hand in the air. Ah. <laughs> He'll be feeling that one for days. The kid's laid out with his head resting on the raised. The kid's laid out with his head. <sighs> the kid's laid out with his head resting on the divots of the yellow warning strip at the platform edge. Cool. And a lot of a lot of like you just saw me like fucking around with that sentence a bunch, uh, chopping it up. Um, and uh, the oh yeah, yeah, I'm happy to recap uh, for this whole thing. Like uh, anybody being involved in this editing experience is doing me a huge favor because it is a long and lonely process. If you look up at that that like sixty. Like we're ten percent done after eight days, sixty out of six hundred and thirty-three pages. Whew. God, Lord have mercy. So I'm gonna be at this for a long time, and I'm happy for any company that I can get whilst it's going on there. Uh, but um, yeah, so the, one of the reasons why um, we spent a little bit chopping that up is when I was reading it, it didn't flow right. Like I want the language to have a. a, a and then uh, just the syllables were wrong. Uh, I wanted to flow. The kid's laid out with his head resting on the divots of the yellow warning strip at the platform edge. A pool of blood is spreading beneath him, dotted with islands of gleaming teeth, creeping into a package of peanut M&Ms. A pool of blood, yeah.
dotted with islands of gleaming teeth and packages of peanut M&Ms. Suddenly the sharp smell of acetone and The smell of acetone is rising, overpowering the subway stink of urine and dead rats. Backpack and large containers are subject to random search, the intercom blares overhead. The voice crackles with distortion, the gains turn too high. Jerome looks up at Kaiser, his split lips spewing crimson, his eye. His split lip is spewing crimson and his eyes bulge with astonishment. Kaiser knows exactly what he's thinking. You can't do that. Kaiser's just a surprise. He didn't think he would snap like this. Not on a kid who can't be more than 15 years old. It's a clean break. Kaiser lost his mind so fast and hard he doesn't even feel like himself anymore. For a moment, they're frozen. For a, moment, for a moment, Kaiser and the kid are frozen, staring at each other, both afraid of... For a moment, Kaiser and the kid are frozen, staring at each other, both afraid of what comes next. If you see something, say something, the intercom concludes. One of Jerome's feet is hanging off the platform in just a sock. If a train comes, he's going to get clipped. Christ, you knocked his fucking shoe off, Kaiser chides himself, wondering when the guilt is going to hit. We need quotes uh, on this uh, thing here because uh, he, Kaiser's thinking it, right? The narrator's telling it, but it's him supposing what the kid is thinking, so we need the quotes. Uh, I know, it's, it's getting kind of complicated here. Christ. He knocked his fucking shoe off, Kaiser chides himself, wondering when the guilt is going to hit. Hold on, let me, uh, let me actually message Spathiwa. I wonder if his uh, thing didn't notify. Whew. All right, there we go. Yeah, it's not like Spathy to be going. I don't know, maybe he's busy uh, with coder type shit. But uh, yeah, I'm just getting away with bullshit. Nobody's here to keep me honest. <laughs> so, uh, Christ, he knocked his fucking shoe off, Kaiser chides himself, wondering when the guilt is going to hit. Wondering when the guilt will hit, will gonna hit. Jerome cringes and tries to crawl away when Kaiser looms over him. Stupid fucking kid. Kaiser a, grabs a handful of jacket and drags Jerome back towards the center of the platform so he doesn't get pulled onto the tracks when a train rolls in. Kaiser grabs a handful of jacket and dra drags Jerome back towards the center of the platform. Mm. 
leaving a smeared trail of blood. The shock's worn off, and Guillaume is wailing. Blood. Yeah, let's, let's take out uh, the smeared trail of blood, because we have more blood. Blood, 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 blood. For the blood god. Kaiser grabs a handful of jacket and drags Jerome black. Uh, Kaiser grabs a handful of jacket and drags Jerome back towards the center of the platform. The shock's worn off and Jerome is wailing. More blood spatters onto the concrete with each, every sob. Kaiser ought to be running away, but the throttle's broke. He can't stop himself. Where is he? Kaiser demands. Jerome's trying to talk, but the words come out mangled. His tongue is looking for teeth that aren't there anymore. Where? Kaiser demands. He has a vision of picking the kid up over his head and hurling him onto the tracks. No, don't, Jerome blubs back at him. The two blink in recognition. The black thought began somewhere inside the skull of child-beating drunk Kaiser Duchance and then flashed before the eyes of wounded candy merchant Jerome Naiwu. The whole thing has to be an adverse reaction to the desulfurum, the sudden uncontrollable rage, the schizophrenic idea that the kid can read his thoughts. Can you hear this? Kaiser thinks, but there's no reaction from the kid. Kai Duchance summons the memory of the woman with the knife, her mind gone, her face contorted with flurry. Can you hear this? Kaiser thinks, but there's no reaction from the kid. Duchance concentrates and summons the memory of the woman with the knife. He sees her face contorted with flurry, with fury, the sweat rolling down her face, the bloody slash on her swollen belly. Kaiser tries to put that image in Jerome, not sure how to do it, but then his temples roar with static. Kaiser expels his vision into the kid. He can feel it spitting out of his mind like a gout of flies and it gives him almost excretory relief. The vision hits Jerome like another punch. His eyes screw shut and he curls into a ball. Kaiser tries to put that image in Jerome. Not sure how to do it, but then his temples roar with static. Kaiser expels his vision into the kid. Chance expel.
Somehow, Duchance expels the vision from his mind into the kids. He can feel it spitting out of his brain like a gout of flies. Then he feels an almost excretory relief. The vision hits Jerome like another punch. His eyes screw shut and he curls into a ball. Stop it! Jerome screams. Kaiser doesn't stop. It feels good to unburden himself. Kaiser's pouring into him. Kaiser pours more memories into Jerome. The autopsy pictures of the bloated belly full of eels, the triple homicide from June, from June where they'd been rotting in the heat for two weeks, the explosion at as Salem. The explosion at as Salomon, or as Salmon, where there were too many hands and they couldn't figure out who the extra one belonged to. <laughs> Uh, he then feels, oh yeah, yeah, where does that happen? So let, let's go back to, because this, this is a new uh, paragraph. This has not been, uh, this section has not been edited previously. So this is all new uh, as part of this rewrite. So it's going to be uh, a little more janky than everything else. Kaiser tries to put that image in Jerome. Not sure how to do it, but then his temples roar with static and he can feel the connection form. On the other end, Jerome absorbs the transmission like a punch in the stomach. His eyes screw shut and he curls into a ball. Stop it, Jerome screams. Kaiser doesn't stop. It feels good to unburden himself. More. He pours more of his bad memories into Jerome. The autopsy pictures of the bloated belly full of eels. The triple homicide from June where they'd been rotting in the heat for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a... The roadside bomb where there are too many hands and they couldn't figure out who the extra one belonged to. Jerome begins to convulse. He's just a child. He can't take all these horrors. Kaiser suspects if he keeps on, he'll kill him. Yeah, that's, that's no good.
One last memory for the road, the image of the Jew kid with the curly red hair, the glinting kippa pin. A kid, where is he? Kaiser demands. Darke, China Tafa. You get your own rasps. He's trembling all over. Kaiser can't figure out what the fuck he's talking about. Get up, Kaiser orders. Jerome gets up instantly. There's a confused look on his face. It wasn't his idea to rise. It wasn't Jerome's idea to rise. Jerome gets up instantly, and there's a confused look on his face. It wasn't... Yeah. The kid gets up immediately. Looking confused. It wasn't Jerome's idea to get up. Uh, t it wasn't Jerome's idea to rise. And the impulses flickering through his arms and telling his muscles to con- uh, uh, What is all this uh, channeling of memories? The giver style. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, uh, do chance in this uh, story. I don't want to, like, spoiler. It, we're at the point of wh where the reader shouldn't know exactly what the fuck is going on with due chance, but some strange shit went down, um, in the story. Um, so, uh, Kaiser due chance is like a severe alcoholic. And, uh, one night he's on patrol with his partner, Carl Mason, and he is just drunk as fuck. Uh, we go into how he's been drinking all day and, uh, his partner is having to do log for all the calls. And, uh, he actually, uh, has his partner pull over the squad car, uh, so they can get out and park between or puke between two parked cars. While this is going on, um, on the street, there's a disturbance. This woman is surrounded by a ring of men, and she's screaming, uh, Get it out of me! Um, and she's got a knife in her hand, and she is just uh, uh, like ready to attack anyone. And uh, so he tries to intervene, but he's so fucking drunk at the time that he winds up shooting this woman uh, right in the head. And uh, after he shoots her, uh, like uh, right above the eye, and blows her fucking brains out, she's laying on the street and everything, he realizes that this crazy homeless woman is also pregnant. Fuck. That's not good. And he uh, is just pissed drunk at the time. And uh, it, everything goes from bad to worse for Kaiser Duchance after that. Uh, and in the, I think, two scenes ago, uh, we found, uh, actually three chapters ago, uh, he was visited by the lawyer of the Policeman's Benevolent Association who says, hey, good news for you, Duchance. You're only facing one homicide, not two. That lady wasn't pregnant. Uh, she was at late stage cancer and uh, her like swollen stomach was actually full like these long stringy black tumors like she was full of eels That's the vision that he's having right there. That's fucked up, man. I don't, I don't like that uh, That uh, that whole thing uh, Yeah, so we're, we're still working on this uh, paragraph right here Yeah, I'm excited about uh, the Duchance. So Duchance is a new addition to the story. We had a previous antagonist in the story. It didn't track well with anybody from our beta reader group. They didn't like it. Not one fucking bit. I liked it because um, it was a throwback to like one of the first stories I ever wrote 
uh, from New York City called The Man in Gray. And uh, nobody ever liked that story. Uh, I think I showed it to like my English teacher in like the fucking ninth grade. And she's like, Zach, this is fucking terrible. Why did you write this? Uh, and I, in my mind, I, uh, I was probably, oh, actually, uh, Mantis Code right here. You get a point for that. Bam, you're on the board. Cool. Yeah, so we, we give out points for a successful edit. And that was actually something that was wrong. I was about to fix it, but you caught it before I did. Um, so yeah, it, that villain was like one of my oldest stories and very dear to me. And I love, uh, the concept of the previous villain called the man in gray. And there's some of it in this villain. Um, uh, but we've done like a lot to give him some motivations and, uh, 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 really dive a little bit more. Um, uh, basically previous to this, this villain was like a demon out of hell and it just, it wasn't a good, um, uh, thing. Oh yeah, man. You get points for doing successful edits. That's how we roll. All right, what do we got here in uh, the old LRH? The nerds fucking messaging me about nonsense. I just don't care. All right, hold on. Let me see. Oh, this was days ago. All right, fuck it. Let's get back to the edit. Yeah, uh, so the point system is just basically if somebody has an edit or whatever, we, we give them one point at the end of this whole thing. I'm going to take this and uh, put this in a special thank you section in the book. You can see Spathiwa is leading the uh, charge right here with 36 points. If you do a really good edit, you'll get more than uh, one point, like something where if I really have to like sit down and think and be like, yeah, you're right, um, or something that fundamentally makes this a better book. Um, but even like little typos and shit like that, we're, you know, we're trying to get the best book we can. The impulses flickering through his nerves and telling his muscles to contract didn't originate. Oh, yeah. His arms and legs are taking, taking their orders from Kaiser now. Local programming overridden by a carrier wave. All right, what do we got here? Uh, Dwayne Jones. Uh, he says, that sucked, but I recalled. I, not into points. Uh, <laughs> not into points. Is that you, Dwayne? Good Lord. Big Dwayne Jones. Um, so Mantis Code says, why do we uh, switch 
uh, between uh, referring to the character by his first and last name. One of the things we're trying to do is uh, break up repetition of the word Kaiser. Um, in general, like when we're writing uh, any paragraph, uh, we don't want to use the same word a lot of times uh, because of a phenomenon known as uh, semantic citation, um, which you can you can experience yourself right now uh, if you feel like it. If you say a word enough times, it loses all meaning, uh, right? Like you just say the, 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 you'll get to the point where like, what does the even mean? Um, and that that's the case also. Repetition is something that in general, we try to avoid. Uh, it, it, some of it is necessary, uh, but we try to get to a bare minimum. And one of the ways that we do that is, um, uh, like, you'll call somebody by their pronoun. Pronouns are, like, meant uh, to do this. Uh, like, pronouns are one of the ways that we try to get around having to say somebody's name over and over again. Another way is just by swapping up their first and last name, um, saying their title, saying, like, the policeman or whatever. Uh, but, yeah. Oh, shout-outs to uh, uh, Jira, who says that we out here. Um, but uh, keep in mind that um, that's in the service of uh, um, creating uh, like a smoother flowing dialogue. More important uh, than sort of smoother flowing clarity is always number one. Like the reader has to understand what the fuck is going on more so than they need like for things to like flow or uh, be tight. So if we have a point where um, like if swapping between Kaiser and Duchance is distracting then that's something that we need to fix uh so <laughs> english scholar right there i don't know what the fuck is going on there um let me see the kid rises to his feet immediately surprising them both jerome looks down at his body blood lolls out of his mouth as he blurts what they can both feel it happening the impulses flickering through Jerome's nerves aren't coming from his own brain. The orders making the muscles contract come from Kaiser. Local programming. The local programming is overridden by a carrier wave. So I really like the carrier wave thing. There. That's wild. It don't hurt, Jerome says. He's touching his ruined mouth and his hands are coming away bloody. It's running down the front of his shirt. Kaiser realizes the kid is right. The pain is gone like he downed a palm full of Vicodin. The pounding in his head, the aching in his knee. The throbbing in his hand, they're all gone. Instead, Kaiser feels elevated. Apparently, DeSulfram can't stop him, or can't prevent him from getting drunk on violence. Whatever's happening to the two of them, when it hits you, you feel no pain. Uh, so I never answered uh, my previous question about memory channeling. Uh, I talked about Kaiser's backstory about killing some homeless woman. Um, so... And not without um, uh, not without reason, right there. Uh, it's not known to the reader yet exactly what's happening with Kaiser, right? Like this should be a point at the story where the reader's like, "What the fuck is he doing? It's weird." Um, and then later, uh, we should get into exactly what Kaiser is and exactly what's going on. So this is a superhero story, and at this point, uh, nobody knows who they are or what they do. Um, they have no idea like where their powers are coming from, like uh, how to control them, etc. So I'm not going to reveal that to uh, the people uh, re watching the edit at this time, because I want when the big reveal comes, I want anybody who's still watching to be able to be like, oh, okay, yeah, like that makes sense. Um, but yeah, not uh, not without um, not without cause. Yeah, I'm not I'm not just trying to skim over your question, like because another part of it too is um, like I need to find out like does this big reveal work out okay um, you know we're trying to get this go Kaiser realizes the kid is right the pain is gone like he down don't hurt uh, uh, so I, I wonder if readers will 
it don't hurt. Uh, if they'll be able to track this as it don't hurt, or if that's just like too far afield. All right, uh, what do we got here? Let's uh, let's look at this paragraph again because this is kind of a uh, uh, an important one. Getting to what the the character is able to do, they can both feel it happening. The impulses flickering through Jerome's nerves aren't coming from his own brain. They come from Kaiser. The local programming is overridden by a carrier wave. Yeah. Like local programming overridden by a carrier wave. So this is going way back to um, uh, back when fucking radios and televisions were a thing where we had like carrier waves. <sighs> He's touching his ruined mouth and his hands are coming away bloody. It's running down the front of his shirt. Should we make this a Supreme shirt? Um, this, here's one for the audience. Like, we could add something to his shirt. So this is taking place at around, like, 2004. Um, actually, hold on. What was the iPhone release date? Two thousand seven. Okay, we can't. Thirsty can't have an iPad or an iPhone. God, was it just two thousand and seven? That's wild. Pages. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that puts a. Uh, all right, so so like two thousand seven. Uh, this goes down. Uh, what do we got here? Kaiser realizes the kid is right. It doesn't hurt. The pain is gone like he downed a pound full of Vicodin. The pounding in his head, the aching in his knee. Instead, Kaiser feels elevated. Apparently, desulfurum can't prevent him from getting drunk on violence. Whatever's happening to the two of them, when it hits you, you feel no pain. Shout out to Bob Marley. Um, uh, so, also, uh, all throughout the book, um, there are like little weird asides like that to music uh, throughout the story. Like woven in, there are probably like about, you could have a fucking soundtrack uh, to this book out of all the song references that you'll find uh, kind of sprinkled in throughout this. I think there's like one every chapter. So find them if you can. Um, the platform rumbles, the sixth train cometh. Yeah, yeah, Dwayne. Like, so see if you can spot all the, as you're, as you're uh, watching through the edit, anytime where you spot a reference to a song, uh, let me know if you can see it. Because some of them are hidden pretty well, too. Uh, it's like a little game you can play while you're watching the edit. The platform rumbles, the sixth train cometh. Kaiser should get out of here. The kid's standing as still as a soldier. All right, what do we got here? Uh, yeah, shout out to Big Dwayne in the chat right there. Legendary Lenny sends us a YouTube link. All right, what is this YouTube link? Does it pertain to what's going on here? It's a breaking news alert. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't have time for some fucking meme horseshit. We got a story to write. Uh, sorry, man. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know what the fuck that's all about. The platform rumbles, the sixth train cometh. 
Kaiser needs to get out of here before the transit police arrive. Beside him, Jerome is standing as still at a soldier at attention. Blood trickles from the corners of his mouth. Kaiser can't leave him here. Too many questions. If anyone asks, you fell. Kaiser's voice starts off threatening, but he realizes there's no need. Jerome's eyes are locked in him. Glassy. Dilated. Broken. Glassy and dilated. Broken. Megalus are rubbing. Megalus are rubbing aside in Kaiser's mind to reveal a forbidden idea. He could order Jerome to leap in front of the six train, and the kid would do it. No hesitation. It's unspeakable power. Come with me, Kaiser demands. Come with me, Kaiser orders, and Jerome has no choice. Propelled by Kaiser's will and missing a shoe, Jerome lurches forward like a zombie. They're halfway up the stairs when the train pulls in and the passengers spill out. Cries of dismay ring out at the bloody mess Kaiser left behind. Damn. Man, that's wild. Uh, so, Jer oh, so Dwayne, as you're like reading through this, if you think a sentence needs a change, uh, try to say as much of the sentence as you uh, can, because I, I can't uh, tell which... Uh, which part of the, like this whole mass uh, you're thinking about. But yeah, like definitely if you see something wrong, just try to tell me as much of uh, this sentence as you can so I can pinpoint and make it make the change. It's a fucked up chapter right here. Uh, so here is uh, Kaiser Duchance punching a kid, uh, raping his mind, and then turning him into his child soldier. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty fucking weird. Right there, how long uh, is this guy right here? Let me see. So that's chapter three. Uh, so Dwayne says, I can't speak. Oh, huh, weird. How many words was this guy? Okay, that's about 1,800 words right there. Uh, uh, actually closer to 1900 words. Oh, he can't speak because people are asleep. I see. Shout out to your roommate, Dwayne. Let's see. So, day eight. Chapter three. Uh, Ryan the Southerner, bro, I'm going to my first year of high school. Uh, yet I can't even open a can of whole potatoes without asking for help. Well, Ryan, like, why don't you just man up and open the can of potatoes? Like, what are you fucking, like, there are two ways to open a can, right? One is with, like, one of those crank-type can openers, and the other is with one of those little punctury type cans. Like, uh, so Dwayne, uh, would have left a bit of this alone, uh, no criticism, Generally, like I'm, I'm pretty solid on some of the changes that I make here. Um, I've usually got a reason, but if you ever wonder why I'm taking something out, I'm happy to like talk about the thought process about why certain elements of this are removed. Okay, uh, hold on just a second. Let me see how long uh, we edited for today. Okay, so I don't know how to use the thingy that opens the crank type ones. Like literally, you just uh, open the two jaws of the thing, you put it over the little uh, indent on the rim, and then you bite it down. Have you never opened a can before in your life? Uh, so Mantis Code says to do another chapter. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, right. Because you asked. Yeah, I, I honestly like I, like the big part is that I'm like uh, waiting for uh, Spiffy Wa to be here because he really is like a pretty instrumental part of this whole thing. It's getting like a lot of good edits that I miss. 
uh, and logic, and both of them are gone at the moment, but um, whatever. Let's do uh, chapter four. Tell that to the post. So in this chapter, uh, we meet uh, Gerald. Uh, 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 fucking. I don't like that uh, the previous chapter is Jerome, and now we have Gerald. Um, because they're, they're both are going to like stick in their reader's thing. We could potentially change Gerald's name. Uh, Jerome, we can't change his name because he has a nickname, Romy, um, and he comes up more places in the story. Uh, but I do like, uh, uh, Big Gerald. But, um, alright, let's try and get through, let me see how many chapters this is. So chapter, page 65, 1, 2, 3, 4, oh yeah, it's only 4, alright, we, we can definitely get through 4 pages. Alright, so this is Tell That to the Post. Uh, this takes place at 9.06 p.m. at Gerald's place, uh, which is on, I want to say, maybe, the, I can't I can't remember, they're either on the Upper East Side or Upper West Side, so these guys would be uh, across 110th Street. Pimps trying to find a woman that's weak. Woo! Uh, all right, what do we got here? So, Thirsty and Matthew live four blocks from each other. But Matthew's building has a doorman, and Thirsty's has a sign saying that only residents and guests are permitted within by the city housing authority. Okay, so we're changing that up uh, to there. So here we're trying to draw a contrast uh, between their economic backgrounds. Uh, Matthew's uh, father is involved in like the administration of the city, and they're quite wealthy. Uh, Thirsty's grandma is dirt fucking poor. Thirsty has nothing. Um, might as well kiss S. That's a little early in the morning to be hitting the sherry there, Dwayne. I gotta take a break from drinking myself. Yeah, like last night uh, with that AMA, that was like quite the hurrah uh, for me. And I uh, I want to <laughs> take a break for a little bit. Uh, I, I definitely drank a lot of whiskey to get through talking to those weird uh, Orthodox Christians. They're so strange. Anyhow. Thirsty and Matthew live four blocks from each other, but Matthew's building has a doorman. And Thirsty has a sign that reads. And Thirsty's building has a sign that reads, Only residents and guests permitted within by the city housing authority. So we're basically just trying to say that uh, Thirsty lives in public housing. They play Xbox for a few hours until Thirsty. Oh, uh, when did the Xbox get released? Oh, uh, yeah, the original Xbox. Yeah. That's a shame. Old MT Dubs is locked up in jail. Okay, so that came out in 2001. <sighs> Very insensitive for them to release it, like, right after that tragedy. How dare they? <laughs> All right, uh, so... What do we got here? Um... Yeah, I think we'll go back and change the, uh, hold on, we're going to, we're going to make a change to a cable here, because I want to push the story back a little bit further, and we have to change one of the phones, right, because we, I didn't realize, like, I didn't realize it took till 2007 for them to come out with the iPhone. Nokia, Thirsty says. Okay, cool. So we give him a fucking Nokia uh, instead of a... Uh, so he has the snake game. He doesn't have an iPhone. There's little tiny things like this. Um, but, like, they're important because a reader a reader is like, wait a second, there were fucking iPhones back in 2001, and they're not in the story anymore. Um, so I try to get as much of the, uh, the facts of the story correct. Uh, but there's also... Uh, this is partly the job of an editor and a proofreader, to things like that I miss, uh, they're supposed to catch those things. And the editor I'm working with now, actually, uh, a guy named Tim, 
uh, did a really good job in the sample edit of Space Tards. He caught like a few things like, oh, that's not how you talk about naval vessels and so forth. And I was like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. They play Xbox for a few hours until Thirsty finally gets hungry enough to go home to his grandmother. When Thirsty leaves, Matthew's father is in the kitchen, scowling at the mail. Or scowling at something that happened to him earlier today. Or maybe just scowling. Oh yeah, this is not a good line. When Thirsty leaves, Matthew's father is in the kitchen, scowling at the mail. Or maybe he's angry at something that happened earlier today, or at life in general. It's the only expression the old man has anymore. Gerald and Matthew have not gotten along since elementary school. Uh, so Dwayne would have kept that, but I don't know what part he would have kept. <laughs> keep in mind, keep in mind, I can only glance at the screen that has the chat um, every every minute or so. I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay, what's going on over there? And mostly, I'm like focused on this screen right in front of you, right here. Uh, what's on there? So if you want anything to be reflected on, you have to give me like a little bit about what part uh, we cut out. So I struck it. Well, it's gone like the wind. Um, I've been fighting every night since the last report card came. I mean, Dwayne makes a, a good point there. Very, very often, like as we're editing, you'll find, and, and one of the things that I find with um, uh, like certain editors is that they'll, like we did, um, we had another editor take a crack at Space Tarts and give me a sample chapter. And uh, like one of the cardinal sins of editing is changing things just to make a change. Uh, and I'm sure that I'm doing this in many places. I'm like, oh, what about this or what about that? Um, because I'm the original author of the piece, like it's always gonna be in my voice. So it's okay for me to change something just to change it, like I changed my mind. I'm like, ah, oh, this would be a little bit better or whatever there. But when you're editing somebody else's work, uh, it is absolutely a sin to um, uh, change something just to change it. When you're editing somebody else's work, Every decision that you make needs to be informed by, like, I have a reason for doing this. I think this makes the piece uh, better in this way. And, like, all these little tiny peccadillos and stuff like that, um, you wouldn't change uh, because they're part of the author's voice right there. And an editor that I, the, my first editor that I worked with for years and years, she was really, really good at this. Um, in, in fact, editors that are really good uh, it is... It's weird. Um, so we give out awards for editors, like every year, science fiction editors at the Hugos and the Nebulas and so forth. But those awards are really weird because like if a good editor, when they've done their work, shouldn't be able to tell that they've done anything, right? Everything should be hidden. Um, and the only thing, the only way that you even know, like an editor was really good, was that nothing in the story stops you from imagining things, like uh, seeing the author's vision and it just flows effortlessly. 
So it's it's kind of weird that we give out an award for something that should be totally invisible when it's done. But those people are vital. Like no book reads perfectly without an editor uh, taking a crack at it. Um, I never uh, told you all by the gut there. All right, well, um, yeah, just if you want me to take a deeper look at something, just make sure to include a bunch of the line there. So when Thirsty leaves, Matthew's father is in the kitchen scowling at the mail. Or maybe he's angry at something that happened earlier today or at life in general. It's the only expression the old man has anymore. Gerald and Matthew have not gotten along since elementary school, and the situation has been in free fall since Matthew's last report card. Mm hmm. Let's see. There's T with a big ass T. Oh, yeah. That's so I'm going to give Dwayne a point for that right there. Yeah. Because Twisted is wrong there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I feel like actually we we gotta uh, strike that. I don't Gerald didn't even say hello when he came in. Things must have gone bad at the union meeting. Okay, so um, we're establishing uh, who Gerald is right now. He's, I think he's like an alderman or something. Um, but yeah, that's that's better. Good, uh, good edit there, Dwayne. Mm. Yeah, Spathy Wah is going to get jealous as fuck if you overtake him in the edits there. All right, um... <laughs> Gerald didn't even say hello when he came in. Things have, uh, things must have gone really bad at the union meeting. Don't you have other friends, Matthew? Yeah, let's just do gone bad. We don't need to. We don't need a um, an adverb there. Wait, is is really an adverb? It's got L Y. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's an adverb. I wish I could touch type a scholar. Well, it's never too late to learn, Twain. Even uh. Even at your advanced age, uh, you, there's a video game called Typing of the Dead uh, that will absolutely teach you to touch type. Mm -hmm. Don't you have other friends, Matthew? The black kid is a loser. Keep hanging out with him. Before you know it, everyone will think you are too.
Let's see. <laughs> Let's just make it a jury duty notice. <sighs> Don't you have other friends, Matthew? Gerald prods, glancing over the top of a jury duty notice. Matthew doesn't answer him. He heads towards... Uh, yeah, I have an outline there. Uh, don't you have any other friends, comma, Matthew? Let's, let's take a look. Boom. Jiro's got his point number two. That's a good edit right there. That's a good comma. Don't you have any other friends, Matthew? Gerald prods. <laughs> so it wouldn't be Matthew like that. It would just be Matthew. Matthew doesn't answer him. He's headed for the fridge to see if there's any pizza left. That black kid is a loser. Keep on hanging out with him. Pretty soon everyone else will, everyone will think you are one too. <laughs> Black kid is a loser. <laughs> that black kid is a loser. Keep on hanging out with him. Pretty soon everyone else Keep on hanging out with him. Uh, yeah, so this doesn't track. That black kid is a loser. Keep on hanging out with him. Pretty soon everyone will think you're one too. That's more Gerald's voice. That black kid is a loser. If you keep hanging out with him, everyone will assume you are too. There's a poison eagerness in his father's eyes. Matthew can tell he's been waiting for this. Still, he takes the bait. That's bullshit. Thirsty's not a loser. He's... Ow! That's fucking bullshit. Thirsty's not a loser. Yeah. Thirsty's not a loser. He's ow! Gerald claps him hard on the side of the head. Gerald claps Matthew on the side of the head. It sends his glasses flying off. Curse at me again, you little shit. I'll fucking knock your block off. Matthew's stunned. He raises a hand to the stinging side of his face. He raises a hand to his stinging cheek. Gerald keeps ranting. He must have been stewing on this monologue for hours. Matthew can smell beer on his breath. Matthew can smell beer on his breath. He should have never come into the kitchen. Um... Mantis Code said, uh, what is their relationship? 
Would a father really say, knock your block off to his kid? Yes. And just take my fucking word for it there. Yeah, no, uh, by the way, this is no uh, reflection on any uh, parents of mine or anything like that. But uh, I can guarantee there are, there are fathers who would say that exact uh, thing to their child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just as we're going through the books and anything like that, anything that would uh, uh, be personally, I try to like not have any connections whatsoever to my own uh, family members. So most of this is shit I'm ripping off from other people's life stories that I know about. Um, cause I don't, I just don't want to get my uh, own family involved in like my show or the writing or whatever, because, uh, people on the internet are insane. So, uh, yeah, generally this is a uh, shit that I rip off from my friend's stories. Um, if I want something that's true to life, but Matthew's stun cursing me again, you little shit. I'll fucking knock your block off. Gerald Bellows. Uh, no, we don't even need that. So, not triggered. Um, what do we have here? Uh, yeah, and by the way, like, yeah, I'm sure that some of the people reading this have had, like, uh, similar uh, experiences with uh, parents knocking their fucking block off there. So, feel free to, like, hop in if you're like, ah, I don't feel that that's true. Like, where Mantis Code is like, ah, is this, you know, is this true or is there, it's a good question to ask. Uh, so never feel um, never feel bad uh, at all about questioning like the reality of like would a character really do this or whatever. Those are always good questions to consider. Uh, it's just in this case I happen to know that um, <laughs> parents will occasionally threaten to knock people's blocks off. And what the hell kind of drug dealer name is Thirsty anyhow? Keep this shit up. Keep up the bad grades and the back talk. I'll put you right out on the street. If you like these niggers so much, you can go live with them. Yeah, so apparently his dad is uh, Quentin Tarantino. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, apologies for the hard R uh, to our listening audience here, but this is, uh, this is his father right here. This is how this character um, sees the world. His dad is uh, racist as all get out right there. Um, so, and what the hell kind of a drug dealer name is Thirsty? Anyhow, keep this shit up. Keep up the bad grades and the back talk. I'll put you right out on the street. Yeah, this should be a separate sentence. I'll put you right out on, I'll put you out on the street. I'll put you out on the street. If you like those niggers so much, you can live with them. Boom. Uh, and Gerald is not a sympathetic character. Um, Gerald is a little bit of an asshole here. So, and then Matthew is stunned. His, Matthew's mouth falls open. He can't believe Gerald's saying this awful shit. He feels tears starting to form and he fights them down. They boil away into anger. Uh, so Dwayne says he never hit anyone other than to defend, but that's um, also a little bit. Matthew is um, a difficult character in this work. He's not a good person, right? Um, he wasn't a good person in the arcade scene earlier. He has some redeeming qualities, but uh, he's not a character that the reader is going to identify with for the most part and be like, oh, you know, if only, you know, like um, it's kind of a dick. Uh, and I want people to see like why he is this way. And, uh, he just does not have, is not a good relationship with his dad. What do you got to say for yourself? Huh? Tough guy. Gerald thinks he's winning. Gerald thinks he's winning. He thinks he can make Matthew cry. Instead, a sudden fury grips Matthew. He wants to pounce on Gerald, hit him as hard as he can, but he knows how that'll end. He'll get annihilated.
Gerald thinks he's winning. But Matthew's furious. Gerald thinks he's winning, that he's about to make Matthew cry. Instead, Matthew is furious. He wants to pounce on Gerald. Instead, Matthew is furious. He stares at his father's sneering mouth and wants to punch it as hard as he can. But he knows how that'll end. So I like here, this is a link between uh, the previous chapter, Duchance uh, just whopping Jerome in the mouth, and Matthew wants to do the same thing to Gerald. Uh, so this is like a weird synchronicity, but he can't do it. Uh, what are you fucking... What are you doing, Siri? All right, fuck off, Siri. Just a second. This fucking robot. <sighs> no idea what triggered that motherfucker. All right. Um, Gerald thinks he's winning, that he's about to make Matthew cry. Instead, Matthew is furious. He stares at his father's sneering mouth and wants to punch it as hard as it can. But he not. Okay, cool. So, a little tune-up on this paragraph here. Gerald thinks he's winning. That he's about to make Matthew cry. Uh, instead, Matthew's furious. He, stare, he stares at his father's sneering mouth and wishes he could punch the smile right off it. But he knows how that would end. He'd get annihilated. That's exactly what... Ger it's exactly what Gerald wants. An excuse. Yeah, um, it's rather than that's. Matthew swallows his anger. He's got a better plan. Yeah? Yeah? Fuck you. I'll go right now. I'm going to Mom's, and I'm going to tell her you hit me. Good luck in court, Gerald. You come back here. Don't you fucking walk away from me. A hundred bucks, Matthew says, remembering his, his empty wallet, the Metro card he gambled away. What? A hundred bucks, and I won't tell social services about this. Are you... Are you fucking trying to extort me? Are you seriously... Gerald's flummoxed by the shakedown. Oh, you know what? It's an election year. Maybe I shouldn't go to social services. 
Maybe I should go to the post. Gerald freezes, seeming to sober up instantly. Matthew, this is not funny. I want you to think really hard about what you're doing right now. Don't burn your bridges. All right, that, so that's a period, not an ellipsis. In general, the feedback that I've gotten from editors is to just never fucking use ellipses. Ever. Never. Never, ever, ever, ever. But uh, they just really hate it when uh, uh, annihilated two times in a couple of sentences from Dwayne. Let's find out where... So we got annihilated there in one sentence. That's the one use there. Terse. Where is the other annihilated? Maybe in the previous chapter? All right, let's 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 find all our instances of annihilated going back a little bit. Because annihilated is a word that you can't use too frequently. You get annihilated. And then there are three instances of annihilated in this book. Uh, yeah, and they're all, yeah, so turns out that that's not a correct edit. Uh, yes, on proximity. So we, we actually only use it once, uh, there. It just seems like we use it a bunch of different places because we went back and forth and kept editing the thing all those times. Uh, so we use it three times in the book, but they're separated by, um, uh, one's going to be, uh, like three chapters from now. Another one is going to be like way deep in the book. I am okay with that, that, uh, frequency. Uh, I feel, uh, like Gerald goes defensively too quickly after being threatened. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair bit. He's yelling in rage. Uh, then all of a sudden, he's uh, on like, "No, please don't tell." Just an observation. I think it's a good one there. And I think um, uh, so. Here's the thing: uh, he knows that if Matthew goes to social services, he's fucked, right? Because he's a child abuser. You know, he's beating his kid. Um, uh, he's a drunk, and uh, like life is not going to go good for him if Matthew actually does go to the post. So it is the moment where the kid is just like, I'm going to do this thing. And it's like, ooh, ooh, that could be bad for me right there. Um, but I like...
Let's see. That circus is not fiction. Uh, I don't know what you mean, Dwayne. Oh, you know what? It's an election year, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't go to social services. Maybe I should go to the post. Gerald freezes, seeming to sober up instantly. He probably knows Matthew's bluffing of it. just has zero to do with reality. I know reality. Go down to Hellhole and find out. What are you talking about, Dwayne? Yeah, is it like some section of the book in particular? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, if you're talking about part of the book or something that's going on in IRC. Matthew's never threatened to go to the papers before. There we go. So I think uh, I think really good edit from uh, Mantis Code right there. I'm gonna go ahead and give him two points on that one because I think it's a really uh, good note that um, the transition from like ah fuck you kid I'll knock your block off to whoa whoa here wait, wait, wait let's not let's not talk about going to the New York Post. Um, it's uh, an important transition, and it's one that we can smooth out a little bit with there. Okay, let me look. take a look at um, uh, social welfare, make book real, so fake, uh, I know what I speak of, but get it right. Okay, yeah, Dwayne, like, help me out here. What what part are you talking about that doesn't feel real to you? Um, maybe, like, the part about social services? Let me see. Yeah, those are the people who would investigate. Uh, who would... Investigate a domestic. Uh, who investigates domestic violence? NYPD Domestic Violence Task Force. Uh,
Let's see. Dear colleague. Okay, so that's what Dwayne's saying. It wouldn't be social services. Domestic Violence Bureau. Elder Abuse Unit. The Brooklyn DA. Okay. Who investigates child abuse in my C? Uh, child welfare. ACS Office of Special Investigation. What is ACS? Uh, Agency for Child Services? Oh, uh, yeah. So actually, this is a good edit for Dwayne right here. It took me a second to like figure out what he was talking about. Um, but uh, wait, nice deflection. I totally blew it, but get it right. I know what I speak of. Wayne, it's hard to take edits from you. Uh, you're not very specific. Um, so let's go to, what's the name of this agency right here? Administration for Children's Services. Ooh, so that's why we do that. You know what? We'd, he'd call it child services. Child services. Okay. Um, and then Dwayne says, you are never mine. Dwayne, I, I like, honestly, I don't know what you're talking about right there. You need to be... So with editing, keep in mind that, um, you know, there there are a lot of words on the screen and so forth. So the more specific you are with like the part of something that doesn't seem real to you or doesn't seem right, the more chance there is that I can figure out what's going on and try to fix it. Um, if you're not specific, then I, I don't know. I could be talking about anything. So Dwayne says that we completely dropped the ball and that he gives up. Um, okay. Well, I tried, Dwayne. That's all I can do. Um, but I do think that child services is the right thing, so I'm still going to give Dwayne a point right there because that's an important note it wouldn't be social services it would be the administration for child services okay so oh you know what it's an election year isn't it maybe i shouldn't go to child services maybe i should go to the post bam uh yeah I think there are like there are a bunch of things in this scene where you could be like, ah, that doesn't feel real to me, right? Because it's like a terse scene where it's a confrontation, and it's not it's not something that you would normally see. Like it's not every day that most people threaten to uh, go to the the papers over their their creepy dad. But um, social services is fine, according to Dwayne. I think child services is what he would uh, threaten right there, because uh, another part about Matthew is like one, he's uh, he's listed as kind of precocious, right? Like he picks up a lot of facts and so forth and his father being in government, he would probably, uh, and the fact that, you know, this has happened before, obviously he would know who he would report uh, child abuse to. Um, so it's, it's good to have him pick the correct agency right there. All right. Um, and keep in mind also, Dwayne, this is not in Canada. This is in New York. Uh, so just some of the names are going to be a little bit different. Are you fucking trying to extort me? Uh, are you, are you fucking trying to extort me? All right. Are you seriously? Yeah, there, okay, that's better. I'm not giving you a cent. In fact, your allowance is canceled starting right now. Don't you ever threaten me. Yeah, I, I really like that addition right there. Uh, and this is, I know this shit, and this is pretentious. Hmm. 
Oh, well, you know, feel free to suggest a change. Uh, but generally, um, yeah, like, what do you think should change? Matthew knows he's gone too far. He knows he ought to stop and retreat to his room. Matthew knows he's gone too far. He should stop now and hide in his room. Hope that you're... I hope Gerald doesn't remember this tomorrow. But something in Gerald's voice tugs at him. He's afraid. He's afraid there's blood in the water. Well, you know what? It's an election year, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't go to child services. Maybe I should go to the post. Gerald freezes, seeming to sober up instantly. Matthew's never threatened to go to the papers before. Instead... Matthew, this is not funny. I want you to think really hard about what you're doing right now. Don't burn your bridges. Gerald, I want you to reach good and deep into your wallet and give me a hundred bucks. Pull it out nice and easy. Don't burn your fingers. <laughs> Do kids even say bucks anymore? A that... hundred bucks. Yeah, who fucking says bucks any longer? I do, but I'm I'm ancient. Yeah, I, I don't know. Kids are probably talking about that drip and hundos and shit like that. <laughs> Give me a hundred bucks. Pull it out nice and easy. Don't burn your fingers.
Gerald's emptying out his wallet. Gerald's emptying his wallet onto Matthew. Tell that to the fucking post, you little shit. Uh, here. Tell that to the post, you little sh Yeah. Tell that to the post, you little shit. Matthew's head is still spinning. Everything is going gray. Gerald hit him so hard he went colorblind. That's all you're getting from me. Forever. Get your stuff and get out. I never want to see you again. Is that a note of finality in his voice? Is this the last straw? Matthew has no retort. He picks up the money in his glasses and heads to his room to pack a bag. After a few minutes, he can see colors again, though everything seems a little washed out. He takes a long time packing. Matthew takes a long time packing. He knows this is really it. He's fucked up big time. Then he hears Gerald stomp back into the kitchen. There's the chunking noise of the ice machine spitting cubes into a tumbler. The sound of the old man fumbling with the lock on the liquor cabinet. Oh shit. Those sounds make Matthew feel very, very small. He knocked the old man off the wagon. Now Matthew's stuffing shit into the backpack frantically, throwing on his jacket and making for the door. There's a tracked animal look in his eyes until he's... Yeah, that's, that's not... He can't talk about a look in his eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh...
cool. Uh, stuffing shit into uh, the backpack frantically. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair edit. Actually, there's no reason for that to just be stuffing shit. Boom! Let's give him another point. Matthew's taking a lot of time packing up, hoping Gerald will change his mind, but he knows he won't. This is really it. He fucked up big time. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> he knocked the old man off the wagon. Now Matthew's frantic, stuffing things into his backpack, throwing on his jacket and making for the door. Yeah, so I see I see what you're saying with the uh, frantic uh, part there. So uh, what we're looking for here is the juxtaposition of initially he's like, eh, I don't want to go. And then he hears uh, that his father is opening the liquor cabinet and he's like, fuck. And uh, needs to get the fuck out of there there. Uh, hoping Gerald will...
All from the sound of ice cubes. Okay, so we did a lot of work on uh, to that section right there, and I think a lot of that is um, um, stemming uh, from Mantis Code's uh, notion that we needed to uh, justify our transition from what to what. And this is uh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, this is, I may be uh, like overselling this point here where it's like, uh, but I have I have friends who uh, have gone through significant domestic abuse and so forth, and uh, I've seen them just get like fucking triggered by weird shit, and not in the like oh my god, I can't believe you misgendered me uh, type trigger, but in the like you can see them having a, a like straight up panic attack over something relatively small, and um, uh, yeah, so we're we're a little bit uh, reaching towards that kind of thing. There is that a note of finality in his voice? Matthew's taking a lot, or let's read through this whole thing uh, before, because we're about to the end of the chapter. That's all you're getting from me, forever. Get your stuff and get out. I never want to see you again. Gerald spits out each word and then walks away, leaving Matthew on the floor. Is that a note of finality in his voice? Is this the last straw? Matthew has no retort. He picks up the money in his glasses and heads into his room to pack a bag. After a few minutes, he can see colors again, though everything seems a little washed out. Matthew's taking a lot of time packing up. He has a thin hope Gerald might change his mind, but he's pretty sure he won't. Uh, I don't like that. Well, with every minute that passes, it seems less likely. This is really it. He fucked up big time.
I'm wondering if he's about to shout. Matthew hears Gerald stomp back into the kitchen and he freezes, wondering if he's a bet. Uh, uh, yeah. I think he's about to get yelled at for taking too long. Instead, he hears the chunking noise of the ice machine spitting cubes into a tumbler. shit. Those sounds make Matthew feel very, very small. He knocked the old man off the wagon. I really like this juxtaposition where he's like kind of like an asshole kid like ah, I'll tell the fucking post about you blah 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 where he's talking all big and everything but as soon as that ice machine goes it's a whole he's like fuck this uh, I really really dig um, that transition right there and I think we've done like really good work uh, shoring up this chapter Matthew's taking a lot of time packing up he has a thin hope Gerald might change his mind, but with every minute that passes, it seems less likely. This is really it. He fucked up big time. Matthew hears Gerald stomp back into the kitchen and he freezes, thinking he's about to get yelled at for taking too long. Instead, he hears the chunking noise of the ice machine spitting cubes into a tumbler. Then Gerald curses softly as he fumbles with the lock on the liquor cabinet. And the sound of hands fumbling with the lock on the liquor cabinet. Oh, shit. Those sounds make Matthew feel very, very small. He knocked the old man off the wagon. As quietly as he can, Matthew begins stuffing things into his backpack, throwing on his jacket. He creeps up to his bedroom door and listens until he hears Gerald's footsteps stalking out of the kitchen. Then he counts to twenty. Then Matthew counts to twenty and slips across the living room and out the front door, careful not to make a sound.
Okay. No, Spathy Was says, sorry, I was sleeping. God, you missed some uh you missed some good edits right there. Dwayne uh actually got some edits in there, but then he became uh frustrated with the stream and stalked off. Um <laughs> I tried to highlight you too. I don't even know what time it is in uh uh jolly old Lundongs or wherever you're at there. Uh that is amazing. Yeah, man. Look 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 at what we got right here. Two edits for Dwayne, and there were actually some good ones. Oh, it took it took a long time to like ferret it out. So Dwayne actually got a cor correction where I had said uh, Matthew was threatening to go to his father uh, about social. Or he was threatening to go to social services, um, and then Dwayne made me like stop and think about it. And it's not actually not social services he would go to; it's child services uh, because he's a child. Uh, an important distinction, but um, um, yeah, he got a couple of good ones there. So Matthew, but then he said something in the story was bullshit, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. And so now I'm just like, oh, what bullshit is he talking about? Um, Matthew panics and takes the stairs, 28 flights down. In the lobby, he rushes past the doorman and hits the streets. All from the sound of ice cubes than a glass. When his heart stops pounding and he can think straight, Matthew glances over his shoulder to make sure Gerald hasn't followed him. He checks his wallet. $223. Matthew knows it's barely anything. Going to his mother's was a bluff. He isn't welcome there either. Crazy Jew Hausterlitz has become a creature in the street in a space of a few minutes. Grabbing his other pocket, he realizes he left his phone upstairs, plugged into the charger. Fuck it, Matthew says, loud and angry enough that it turns the head of a woman pushing her laundry cart past. Uh, that's that's an awkward sentence right there. There's nowhere he can go. Crazy Jew Hausterlitz has become a creature of the streets. And that... A creature of the streets in the space of a few minutes. Grabbing his other pocket, Matthew realizes he left his phone upstairs, plugged into the charger. Fuck it, Matthew says. A woman pushing her laundry cart past him turns her head and looks away. She doesn't even shrug. He's pretty sure he isn't crying. Cool. So that uh, was chapter number four. So we got both chapter number three and uh, chapter number four here. Uh, so if I can get a runtime from somebody, uh, and then let's see how many words we got to today. Shoutouts to Mantis Code here for urging us to do a second chapter today. I really think we did good work in that chapter, and I was just being lazy by not doing one. So that actually pulls us up to uh, 31, uh, 50 words. 3115, yeah, it's not 50. Uh, th chapter three and four. And how many do we have a time? 2.5 hours. 
cool. So day eight. Uh, so uh, Spaffy Wiley's the pack um, with 36. We got Logic next. Sirius has one. Doc Gorilla has one. Sass has one. Jira has two. We got in a second today. Meep Sheep. Mantis Code has four edits. And I think uh, I think I missed some of... Uh, I'm going to give him a point for that Sound of Ice Cubes thing because we did wind up changing that. So Mantis Code up to five. And Big Dwayne uh, with two points. All right. Thank you to everybody who took part in the edit today. I think uh, we did some good work. And we're we're speeding up a little bit. We, we just got to put more time into this. Uh, and I got to be less lazy about it. I'm going to try and uh, uh, got to have some more healthy habits uh, so that I'm not so crazy. Uh, so what you missed today, Spathy Wa, was uh, a Kaizu Du Chance scene where he tracks down uh, Jerome, one of the kids from the arcade, who uh, potentially will give up Matthew's location. Maybe he won't. We don't know yet. Uh, please sort the leaderboard by score. No, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> I'm lazy. Well, maybe I'll do it later. Uh, and then in chapter number four, Matthew gets into an argument with his dad. Uh, he threatens to go to the newspaper about um, his dad hitting him. And then his dad hits him again and kicks him out of the house. Uh, so now he is homeless. Uh, so a lot of violence in the first part of this book. I didn't realize, uh, and I think uh, some of this violence is additional. Um, these last, later on, we tune out some of the like really Tarantino-esque uh, levels of crazy bloodshed. But uh, yeah, it's a, a lot of action in this book, man. This is no, this is no grab it. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. Although shout out, Gravid managed to get some violence in there. I'm like, uh, yeah, actually, there's like a pretty significant beating in like the first couple chapters or whatever there. Uh, but yeah, I like where these two chapters went. I'm sorry you missed it, Spathy. Um, but uh, I'm going to watch the whole thing. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, let me. I could just share the fucking. Um, I can. Sh well, can I do that? Uh, I could potentially share the document with you so you can see the work. I don't know. We'll get to it. Well, thank you for uh, doing it. Uh, I don't think we're going to go back on either of those chapters right there because I'm pretty happy with three and four here. So tomorrow uh, we're going to get to work on chapter number five. And chapter number five is I Sing the Body Electric. So this is where you're going to meet uh, one of the other three titular characters, uh, Sarah Shiner. Uh, who is the electric lady, uh, this chapter, and this is where we get into the first day of the story. Um, so, uh, previous to now, uh, this book takes place over seven, like, compare documents, and we'll be working in track changes, uh, so I'm excited to fool around with that whole thing. And I think we'll do that edit mostly in Microsoft Word, uh, which I need to install on this machine. Ugh, fucking Word. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with this whole deal. And I'm excited to, really excited to work on the edit of Space Tards. And I had a good time. Thank you to everybody who uh, joined in on the editing and everything on this. And uh, 